to enter the inferior part of the middle ear cleft is such a tube enter the inferior part of the major tympanum except the epitympanum any disease in the epitympanum is unsafe type or squamosal type or aticoandral type so basically tube tympanic disease presents as uh, a central perforation in the tympanic membrane there is a perforation in the tympanic membrane pass and secretion discharge through this uh, tympanic membrane and also the infection can enter the middle ear through the tympanic membrane and there is no underlying osteitis or osteomyelitis there is no involvement of the ossicles or the mastoid bone or the temporal bone in tubular tympanic disease that's why it's called safe disease now the symptoms of tubular tympanic or the safe disease or the mucosal disease is otorrhea so mal odorous associated with cholestatoma when otorrhea is associated with uh, Order very foul smelling order. It's associated with cholestatoma, but when there is cholestatoma, it's aticoandral type of disease or the unsafe disease. There is no malodorous uh, secretion in uh, tuber tympanic type, safe type. And another symptom of safe disease is hearing loss uh, due to the tympanic membrane perforation. Uh, till 40 decibels of hearing loss, we can say there is tympanic membrane perforation. If the uh, hearing loss is greater than 40 decibel, then we can suspect the erosion of the ossicles or the discontinuity of ossicular chains. So uh, simply the symptom of chronic otitis media is otorrhea, ear discharge, and hearing loss. Usually there is no pain in chronic otitis media unlike acute otitis media. Now, signs, there's a profuse mucopurulent, it can be, it can be sometimes purulent or sometimes mucus or sometimes mucopurulent, non-foul smelling, there's no foul smell and non-blood stain, there is no stain of blood. This is the signs for tuber tympanic disease, ear discharge. And on otoscopy, what we can see is the central perforation in the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane perforation, and through the perforation, we can visualize the middle ear mucosa, which can be inflamed, congested. There might be polyps, there might be erosion of ossicular chains, sometimes the healing in the tympanic membrane called tympanic sclerosis. And in tuning fork test, we can uh, uh, find out that there is conductive hearing loss. These are the signs of tubular tympanic disease. Here in this picture, as a big central perforation in tympanic membrane, we can see the handle of the malleus. This is the edge of the perforation. This is the attic region. There is, attic region is normal. This is pars flaccida. The perforation is in pars tensa. Similarly here, in this picture, there is a thick pus and there is the congestion of the middle ear mucosa. Here also there is Central perforation, we can see the ossicles. This is promontory, you can see the middle ear through this perforation. In this picture, there is perforation and there is an erosion of the incus. This is the stipis head, stipidal tendon. This into the stipidal tendon, there is erosion. So these are the signs on otoscopy. Now let's uh, learn something about types of perforation. There are three types of perforation. Now basically in uh, Pars tensa, there are two kinds of perforation. One is central perforation and another is marginal perforation. Central perforation means there is a perforation and it is all surrounded by the tympanic membrane remnant. How big this perforation might be, but if there is the remnant tympanic membrane around the perforation, then it's called central perforation. This is large central perforation. Marginal perforation, we call marginal perforation when there is no remnant tympanic membrane at one side. The other side, there is tympanic membrane. On one side, there is no um, membrane, remnant membranes. This is marginal perforation. Marginal perforation is associated with unsafe type of disease or aticoandral type of disease or squamous disease. The central perforation is the feature of the safe disease or the tuber tympanic disease. Now the attic perforation. If there is perforation in the pars flaccida as shown in this picture, and it's called attic perforation. Attic perforation is always the feature of unsafe type of disease or the squamous or the aticoandral type of disease. So attic perforation is always dangerous. Central perforation is safe. Marginal perforation is also dangerous. 
Now, round window sealing effects. Sometimes the patient with chronic otitis media with tympanic uh, membrane perforation, they hear better when they have the ear discharge. This is because the perforation uh, that disables this round window sealing effect when the, um, uh, there is discharge, the round window is again sealed it, just like by a normal tympanic membrane, so they hear better. The round window and oval window are placed uh, at a uh, certain distance so that the, when the sound will strike the oval window, there is a release window in the, in the round window. They have a uh, phase difference. This phase difference is canceled when there is tympanic membrane perforation. The sound waves strike the oval window and round window uh, simultaneously, canceling each other. So this is called round window sealing effect. So in case of um, discharge uh, ear, the round window sealing effect is maintained, just like in normal TM. So they hear better in the presence of discharge. Now the stages of chronic otis, uh, otitis media, the safe type tubular tympanic SI um, uh, type, there are four stages. Active stage when there is a discharge at the time of examination, there's an active discharge, it's active stage, cushion stage. If there's in the recent past, the discharge is there, but right now there is no discharge, it's cushion stage. When and it's called inactive stage if there is no discharge for three to last three to six months when the air is dry. And the heal stage is when the tympanic perforation has healed, it has sealed with the tympanic sclerosis or fibrosis, and there is no more air discharge. The, uh, there is a completely dry air, then it's called heal stage. These are the stages of mucosal type or tuber tympanic type of chronic otitis media. Now the unsafe disease, eticoantral disease or also called squamous disease. These are the chronic inflammatory conditions limited to the posterior part of the major tympanum, attic and the antrum. It's the posterior part of the tympanic membrane, a major tympanum, attic and the antrum. And this is always and usually associated with the erosion of the bone usually by the cholesteatoma. Now, characteristic of this eticoantral disease, the symptoms is the thick, purulent, scanty, and foul-smelling blood stain, persistent discharge. There is no relief in discharge. There is um, minimum discharge, scanty discharge, thick discharge, blood stain discharge, foul-smelling discharge, which persists, which does not get relief, uh, unlike um, mucosal type of disease where the uh, air discharge subsides after uh, medications and then again recur. Here, the discharge never subsides in eticoantral disease. And also mentioned priorly, it is associated with the perforation in the past flaccida or the perforation in attic. Attic perforation is associated with eticoantral disease. Now, the difference between the tuber tympanic and the eticoantral disease safe and the unsafe disease. Now the discharge type of discharge in tuber tympanic safe type is profuse, mucoid, and orderless. In eticoantral onset type, it's scanty, always scanty, purulent, foul smelling, thick. And the perforation is central in tuber tympanic. In eticoantral, it's attic or marginal tympanic perforation. Granulations tissue are uncommon in tuber tympanic, very common in eticoantral disease. If polyp is present, it's pale in tuber tympanic type, red and flesh in eticoantral. Polystetoma is invariably a uh, uh, constituent of eticoantral disease. There is no polystetoma in tuber tympanic. Complication is rare in tuber tympanic. That's why it's called safe disease. And it's very common in eticoantral, uh, unsafe type. Now, audiogram, Puritan audiometry uh, shows conductive hearing loss in tuber tympanic disease. And in eticoantral, it might be conductive or mixed diff diffness with sensory neural component. And the hearing loss is more in eticoantral type of disease. It's mild in tuber tympanic disease. Now, cholesteatoma. What is cholesteatoma? This term was coined by. Uh, I'll take you answer your questions at the end of the class. Okay. This is the term coined by Johannes Muller. Cholesteatoma, the definition of cholesteatoma is a cystic structure filled with desquamated squamous debris lying on fibrous matrix. It's a cystic structure, a cyst-like structure filled with this desquamate, the shading, shaded, uh, shed, squamous uh, epithelial debris lying on a fibrous matrix. It's also called the skin in the wrong place. Cholesteatoma is the skin in the wrong place. 
Now the current definition of cholecystoma, it is a three-dimensional epidermal structure. Epidermal kind of structure is three-dimensional, spread across the, all the three dimensions. And the, another uh, characteristic of cholecystoma, it exhibits independent growth. It grows itself. It has an expansile characteristic. It replaces middle ear mucosa and resorbs the underlying bone. It has the tendency to erode the bone and it replaces the middle ear mucosa, normal mucosa. And also the cholecystoma, this term is a misnomer because there is no cholesterol in cholecystoma and it is also not a tumor. So cholecystoma is basically a misnomer. Its synonym is keratoma. It can also be called epidermosis of ear. Keratoma or epidermosis. Now this is a picture of cholecystoma. This is the said epithelial debris. This is the matrix lined by stratified squamous epithelium, squamous epithelium. That's why it is called squamous disease. Cholecystoma occurs in eticoandral type or squamous disease. And this is the fibrous stroma. This fibrous uh, stroma secretes, produces many erosive substances like metalloproteinases, which erode the bone. And it has tendency to expand by itself, grow by itself, replacing the middle ear mucosa and eroding the surrounding bones. Now, theories of cholecystoma formation, how does cholecystoma form? The first theory is congenital cell race. The cell race, the epithelial cell race, ectodermal cell race might uh, get inside congenitally. In the feature of congenital cholecystoma is that the tympanic membrane is intact. This is a picture of congenital cholecystoma. This is the cholecystoma. The tympanic membrane is intact. The another theory is invagination theory. In invagination theory, the tympanic membrane from the attic and the posterior superior part of pars tensa. This is the attic. This is pars tensa. The tympanic membrane retract inside. This is because of the negative pressure built in the middle ear. Negative pressure in the middle ear is built when the uh, eustachian tube opening gets obstructed and the air in the middle ear cavity is absorbed by the mucosa. So ne negative pressure develops and this retraction occurs. And the squamous epithelium of this outer lining of the tympanic membrane, the, it invaginates inside the middle ear. Another theory is epithelial invasion theory. The squamous epithelium of the TM migrates into the middle ear via the perforation. Through the perforation, the outer layer, which is epithelial layer of tympanic membrane, it migrates inside the middle ear cavity through the tympanic membrane perforation. This is epithelial invasion theory. Epithelial invasion. Now, basal cell hyperplasia theory, this is another theory. Because of the inflammation or the infection, the basal membrane, the germinal layer of this uh, outer epithelial layer, it breaks and it infiltrates, invades the subepithelial tissue in pars flaccida and then goes inside the middle ear cavity, causing the cholecystoma. Now, squamous metaplasia theory here, the cubital epithelium in the middle ear cavity, especially in the uh, posterior part of posterior superior part of middle ear cavity they undergo metaplastic changes to squamous epithelium and they start shedding the epithelial debris and producing the matrix and forming the cholecystoma now the types of cholecystoma it's congenital as we talk and acquired acquired also a primary and secondary primary occur when there is a retraction and the cholecystoma forms as uh, uh, seen in invagination theory and secondary is the uh, when there is tympanic membrane perforation, there is epithelial migration through the tympanic membrane perforation. This is called secondary, secondary acquired, secondary to the tympanic membrane perforation. Here, this is the cholecystoma in the attic. Here, this is acquired secondary cholecystoma. There is epithelial migration through the tympanic membrane perforation. This is the primary through the retraction pocket in the attic. The most common uh, retraction uh, uh, site is the attic because of the pars flaccida. It is weak, pars tensa is strong with organized fibrous layers, but pars flaccida is flaccid and weak, so retraction is most common in the attic region. Now pathogenesis and the clinical findings. So this is the pathogenesis of cholecystoma, how it forms. 
There's a low middle yield pressure, there's retraction, polystema forms, and the keratinogen squamous epithelium expands, uh, produces proteolytic enzymes, erosion of bone, and different pathologies. It's, not, it's in detail, it's not necessary. Okay, now, this is the formation. How does polystema form? This is the invagination theory or the through the retraction pocket. Here, the pars flaccida gets retracted, it forms the polystatoma slowly and it expands. This is the invagination in the attic and this is the invagination in the posterior superior part of pars tensa, this area. This is the attic retraction, then the polystatoma formation. This is posterior superiorly, there's a retraction in the pars tensa and finally the formation of polystatoma. It's shown in the picture. Now the common sites of polystatoma, the most common sites of acquired polystatoma is the first, the posterior epitympanum. The second is posterior mesotympanum and third is the anterior epitympanum. The, the uh, anterior mesotympanum polystatoma is very rare. First, posterior epitympanum, second, posterior uh, mesotympanum, third is anterior epitympanum. These are the common sites of polystatoma. Now the pathology of aticoantral disease, there is Invariably cholestatoma. If there is no cholestatoma, there may be osteitis in the granulation tissue. There's chronic inflammation of the temporal bone or the granulation tissue. Granulation tissue also has propensity to erode the bones. And there is ossicular necrosis and there might be cholesterol granuloma. There's formation of cholesterol granuloma in middle age due to chronic inf uh, inflammation. Now the symptoms of aticoantral disease is air discharge, Hearing loss is more pronounced. There might be bleeding or blood stain, ear discharge. There might be ear ache. There might be dizziness, tinnitus, and the symptoms of complications. Ear ache, there might be ensuing otitis externa or the acute onset of inflammation in the chronic otitis media can cause ear ache. There might be dizziness due to the erosion of the lateral semicircular canal. There might be tinnitus and other signs of complications, uh, symptoms of complications. Now, signs of uh, past tensor cholestatoma on otoscopy, you can see retraction pockets and the flakes of cholestatoma, there might be granulous and tissue, red fleshy polyp, and you can also see the sagging of posterior superior canal wall. The EAC canal wall, the posterior superior part, lies just anterior to the mastoid antrum, so the polystatoma infiltrating the mastoid antrum can erode the bone, anterior canal wall. So it can cause the sagging of the posterior superior canal. And tuning fork test, there is hearing loss. Now, this is the granulation tissue. This is the posterior superior wall. The granular tissue has grown. This granulation tissue must be coming from the antrum. Antrum must be somewhere here. It had eroded the anterior wall of antrum, the canal wall, and enter the EAC. This is the granulation. So if you see this kind of picture, then it is aticoantral type of disease. Again, the cholestatoma here in the attic. There is the attic. There is another central perforation, but here is the cholestatoma in the attic. There is the retraction in the attic. Here also there is the retraction of the attic. This is the flakes of cholestatoma. These are the flakes of cholestatoma. So very foul smelling. Again, the same picture, a big secondary acquired cholestatoma migrating through the perforation. This is the primary acquired that with atric resection and the cholestatoma formation at the attic. Now the investigations. What investigations are to be done? Examination under microscope. We should examine the uh, tympanic membrane and the middle ear through the microscope. We can send pus for culture sensitivity. We should do audiological assessment, X-ray, CT scan of temporal bone, uh, general blood investigations, X-ray PNS to rule out any pathology in nose, and also diagnostic nasal endoscopy to rule out any nasal pathology. Now, examination under microscope. We we have to confirm the otoscopy findings by microscope. Uh, we have to see with microscope the site and the size of perforation can, can be located through the examination under microscope. The margin of perforation, if it is a 
healed perforation or the unhealed fresh perforation, appearance of middle ear cavity through the perforation and if there is presence of polyp or granulation tissue and the location of the granulation tissue. Cuton audiogram to identify the absence of the present absence of auditory functions and to differentiate the types of hearing if there is conductive or the sensory neural hearing loss and the degree of the hearing loss. To find out this, we should do Cuton audiogram. So X-ray mastoid, we can see the pneumatization pattern of the mastoid cell in X-ray. It might be haziness. Uh, there might be uh, haziness or the clouding of ear cells as occurs in uh, acute otitis media or the mastoid cavity might be sclerotic like in chronic otitis media. You can see the position of the tegment also and the sinus split. Now this is the x-ray mastoid. This is the normal x-ray of the mastoid. It's a, this uh, air cells can be seen very prominent air cells uh, giving honeycomb like structure. This is normal mastoid in this Another X-ray, this is a sclerotic mastoid. You cannot see the, appreciate the air cells here. Due to the chronic inflammation, there is a sclerosis of the mastoid. Again, this is also the sclerosis of the mastoid. And this is a big cavity formed by the cholesteatoma with the erosion of the all mastoid antrum and the air cells, a big cavity. Sometimes this is also called automastoidectomy by the cholesteatoma. So if you can see this kind of x-rays, then you need to think about the unsafe disease, eticoenteral disease, the sclerosis and the automastoidectomy cavity. A basic investigations, hemogram, blood sugar, urea and creatinine, urine lysis, ECG, x-ray chest. And the x-ray PNS, this was the haziness of the right uh, a maxillary sinus, it may be uh, some uh, sign of the sinusitis causing the chronic otitis media. Diagnostic nasal endoscopy here is enlarged adenoid at the nasopharynx. This blocks the eustachian tube opening, hampering the ventilation of middle ear. So these things should be nasal pathology, nasopharyngeal pathology should be ruled out. And also the adenoid, frequent adenitis, this uh, infection, bacterial infection may migrate to the middle ear. Now the medical treatment of chronic otitis media, the short-term goal is elimination of infection control and uh, control of otorrhea. The short-term goal is to get rid of the otorrhea. And the long-term goal is to improve the hearing and the finally hearing of the TM so that the further ear discharge otorrhea may be prevented. So how it is done? It is done by oral toileting. We have to clean the ear. It can be done with a dry cotton. It's called dry mopping or we can use the suction irrigation under microscope. Under the microscope, we uh, vacuum suction the secretions and clean the uh, um, EAC and the middle ear. And we can use the topical antibiotics and very occasionally we use systemic antibiotics for the treatment of chronic otitis media. Now, when do we fail treating medically any chronic otitis media? When there is poor drainage of inflammatory exudate from the middle ear, when there is the blockage of eustachian tube, which provides the drainage and the ventilation, there might be collection of inflammatory exudate, providing the bacteria a breeding ground. And the persistent osteitis with the mastoid granulation. If there is granulation and the chronic inflammation of the bone, it also stops chronic otitis media to heal. And if the causative organism, the bacteria are virulent and the very resistant, then still it might persist despite the medical treatment and also because of this nasal and nasopharyngeal pathologies like sinusitis and the adenoids, the reinfection, the mastered um, infection of the middle ear can be occur recurrently due to the, uh, through the eustachian tube and also the allergy. Allergy has the same uh, mechanism of uh, closure of the eustachian tube and the mucosal inflammation of the middle ear cavity. Now the medical myringoplasty, another treatment, chemical cauterization, this is done by the corrosive um, chemical tri trichloroacetic acid. In this, the small tympanic membrane perforations, they are corroded with this trichlorotic acid, exposing the fresh margins, activating the fibroblasts, and these fibroblasts come into the action and cause the healing very quickly. So uh, the limitation is that we can use, use this treatment only in dry years and in a small part for tympanic membrane perforations and it can it uh, may require several sittings it 
may not heal, tympanic membrane may not heal in the just single sitting. Now, medical treatment for cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma generally does not have any medical treatment. It requires surgical removal, but still topical antibiotics with oral toileting can be given, suction clearance, just like in another safe disease. And we can use silver nitrate to you know, ablate this granulation tissue, or we can use ventilation tubes in attic retractions. In attic retraction, we can uh, ventilate the middle ear with keeping the ventilation tubes in the pars tensa. Now, surgical procedures for the treatment of chronic otitis media. It's myringoplasty, the simplest surgery for the ear. It's a repair of the tympanic membrane. It's just the repair of the tympanic membrane. And that one step further is tympanoplasty. Tympanoplasty, <clears throat> this surgery requires the eradication of the disease in the middle ear and to reconstruct the hearing mechanism with or without tympanic membrane grafting. Sometimes tympanic membrane, there is no perforation, so we, we need not do any grafting, but it's the basically the eradication of the disease and the reconstruction of the hearing mechanism. And the osseculoplasty term is just for the reconstruction of the hearing mechanism, reconstruction of the ossicular chain. This is osseoplasty. So tympanoplasty consists of osseoplasty also. There are types of tympano. So myringoplasty, there are certain uh, requirements for the myringoplasty. The ear should be dry. The cochlear reserve should be good. That means there, sh there should not be any sensory neural hearing loss so that after the repair of the tympanic membrane, we can uh, improve the hearing. There should be normal station tube function. Otherwise, the myringoplasty, the new tympanic membrane will again retract and the perforation can occur again. So, eustachian tube function should be normal. And this is uh, to be done in those uh, patients with predominantly conductive hearing loss. So, which can, where, in whom we can improve the hearing. And there should be no cholesteatoma. In cholesteatoma, we need extensive surgery. Myringoplasty won't be enough. Now, types of myringoplasty, we have two techniques. Grafting techniques, only in the underlay, if we put the... Uh, graft underneath the tympanic membrane this only if we keep over the uh, tympanic membrane then it's uh, only and we have different approaches for myringoplasty post auricular transcanalicular or permeatal these are the approaches for the myringoplasties and grafting techniques are only and underlay now types of tympanoplasty we have uh, six types of tympanoplasty different types uh, you need not require this in detail. Type 1 tympanoplasty is just myringoplasty. Myringoplasty is also called type 1. Okay, back again. Types of tympanoplasty. Type 2 is myringo incudopexy. The new tympanic membrane is placed over the incus because the malleus is already eroded. Type 2 is myringo incudopexy. Type 3 is when you place the tympanic, new tympanic membrane graft over the stepes. It's type 3 myringo stepedopexy. Type 4 is cava minor. We put the tympanic membrane directly over the stepes foot plate and we create a very small tympanic cavity, middle ear cavity, a very small, it's called cava minor. The so type 4, type 5 is the fenestration. We make a whole over the lateral semicircular canal. This is the type five and place a graft over it. The sound waves, they strike the hole on the lateral semicircular canal. And in type six, it's a sono inversion. We just keep the round window open and cover the oval window. So there's inversion of the hearing mechanism. The flow of fluid is inverted. This is type six, types of tympanoplasty. Now, cortical mastoidectomy. Now, the surgical treatment for the chronic otitis media. There are two kinds of surgeries for uh, uh, this um, eticoendral type of disease. This canal wall up procedure and canal wall down procedure. Here, canal wall means the external auditory canal the posterior part of the exterior auditory canal wall. When we preserve the canal wall, posterior canal wall of EAC, then it's called canal wall up procedures. When we um, 
remove the canal wall, we drill the canal wall, then it's called canal wall down procedures. Canal wall up procedures is also called closed procedures. The first canal wall up procedure is cortical mastoidectomy. Here we remove the disease from the mastoid antrum. We just drill through the MAC even strangle is the mastoid antrum. We remove the mass, uh, disease in the mastoid antrum if there is cholesterol or granulation tissue or anything. And also around the mastoid air cell system, we remove this air cell system. We make one big common cavity in the mastoid antrum. And we preserve the external auditory canal, posterior wall of external auditory canal. And we ensure that there is a good way, enough adequate way for the ventilation and the drainage of the mastoid antrum through the aditus to the tympanic, um, uh, tympanic cavity and through the eustachian tube. So this is cortical mastoidectomy. mastoidectomy. We just remove the cortex, cortical bone over the mastoid antrum. This is cortical mastoidectomy. Now another canal wall up procedure, more, uh, more extensive surgery is combined approach tympanoplasty. Tympanoplasty with com uh, canal wall up mastoidectomy. In this uh, procedure, we remove the disease from the middle ear and the mastoid, not only from the mastoid antrum, but also from the middle ear cavity, we remove the disease and the, uh, the steps, we just enter, first enter the mastoid antrum and from the mastoid antrum, preserving the posterior canal wall, we do the posterior tympanotomy, we remove the facial breeze and we enter the uh, middle ear cavity through posterior tympanotomy. And then through the transcanal through uh, root, through the ESC, we remove the, we reflect the tympanic membrane and we see the disease in the middle ear and we remove any disease in the middle ear and this, after the removal of the disease, we reconstruct the middle ear transformer mechanism. That means we do the osseculoplasty. This is included in the combined approach tympanoplasty. And all these procedures, these two procedures are canal wall up procedures. We preserve the external auditory canal. Now this is the picture of cortical mastoidectomy. Here, this is the big antrum. We have entered the antrum, there are small, the facial nerve. So posterior tympanotomy is done between the facial nerve and the corda tympani. This is corda tympani. We have entered the facial recess and then to the middle ear cavity, tympanic cavity. This is a combined approach tympan tympanoplasty. Now, now canal wall down procedures. This is called open, these are called open procedures. The first one is radical mastoidectomy. It's a radical mastoidectomy. Here we remove everything. We eradicate the middle ear disease, the mastoid disease. We drill everything. We do not keep any ossicles. We remove all the ossicles and we drill the auditus, attic, middle ear. We remove disease from the everything. We drill the external auditory canal wall, everything. We make a very big ball, very big cavity, which opens to the external meatus. All these cavities are externalized. So the ventilation comes from the outside through the ear canal. And we plug the eustachian tube. We just block the eustachian tube. So the whole ventilation and drainage occurs through the external auditory meatus. Here the all ossicles are removed except the stapes foot plate. This is radical. That's why it's called radical mastoidectomy. Canal wall down. The another is the modified radical mastoidectomy. This one is uh, more common these days. This is the modification of radical mastoidectomy. The modification is that we preserve the hearing mechanism, we preserve the ossicles, and we do not block the um, eustachian tube. We create a very small tympanic cavity, and the rest of the uh, big ball it drains and gets ventilated through the external auditory canal. This is the difference between modified radical mastoidectomy and radical mastoidectomy. Now, indications of modified radical mastoidectomy, if there is cholesteatoma involving the mastoid air cells, it's extensive cholesteatoma and cholesteatoma in only hearing ear. If the patient has the only hearing ear, hear, ear and 
he has cholestomy in that ear only then we should do canal wall down mastectomy the reason for this is that in canal wall up procedures the recurrence is more so we do not want the recurrence in only hearing ear so we do this canal wall down mastectomy and if there after the closed cavity surgery canal wall up procedure if there is recurrence of cholestatoma then we no longer keep the external auditory uh, ESC wall we just drill it and convert it into the modified radical modified radical mastectomy and if the posterior canal wall is eroded by the destructed by the cholestatoma or granulation tissue and we cannot reconstruct that wall canal wall then we have to do the modified radical mastectomy and all those unsafe diseases with the complications intracranial complications then we have to do this modified radical mastectomy and also when there is a poor eustachian tube function the eustachian tube function uh, it cannot ventilate the all parts of the uh, middle ear then we should do this modified modified radical mastectomy now radical mastectomy it's a uh, very seldomly performed these days indications are unresectable cholestatoma extending down to the eustachian tube into petrous apex very extensive extensive cholestatoma in which inverse petrous apex and eustachian tube also then we should do this radical mastectomy if there is promontory cochlear fistula if the cholestatoma has eroded the promontory and has made a hole into the cochlea then we should do radial mastectomy and also other complications like peri labyrinth and cholestatoma that cannot be removed or clean inspected periodically so we should do radical mastectomy and in any neoplasm temporal bone we should do radical mastectomy now the difference between the canal wall up procedures and the canal wall down procedures canal wall up procedures are <coughs> cortical mastectomy <coughs> sorry and um, combined approach tympanoplasty now the meatus or the external auditory canal is normal in canal wall up procedure because we do not remove the posterior auditory canal wall the bone that's why it's normal but in canal wall down procedures we make a very big meatus widely open communicating with the mastoid the whole mastoid antrum and the middle ear cavity will open into the outside into outside with this large opening in the meatus for the ventilation and the drainage so it looks very uh, unsightly it doesn't look attractive this canal wall down procedures from outside now this canal wall procedures all the mechanism of ventilation and the drainage is through the eustachian tube it is a closed procedure that's why it does not require routine cleaning but in canal wall down procedures all those uh, epithelial debris they come out uh, and the, this uh, discharges they come out through the ESC which, which requires regular cleaning and the residual uh, disease or the recurrence of disease is high in canal wall up procedure this is the disadvantage of canal wall up procedure and the advantage of canal wall down procedure the recurrence and the residual disease is very low in canal wall up procedure every canal wall up procedure after six months six months we have to do the second look surgery just remove the tympanic membrane and get, uh, take a look of the middle ear if there is residual or the recurrent disease this is not required in canal wall down procedures so those patients from the villages far away places which cannot show up after 6 months so it's better to do canal wall down procedure patient limitation nil there is no limitation after canal wall up procedures after uh, it's healed they can have a swimming they can engage in water sports but in canal wall down procedures due to the big cavity swimming is prohibited and also the auditory rehabilitation the hearing aid because of the normal eac canal hearing keeping a hearing aid is very uh, easy comfortable for canal wall procedures and because of the very large cavity and the large opening in the ear the fitting of hearing aid is difficult these are the differences between the canal wall and the canal wall down procedures now this is the canal wall down procedure we have drilled this is a large antrum this is the eac wall we have removed this the posterior canal wall the bony wall and we have made this common cavity big ball mastered cavity no eac wall this is the cavity of eac and this is the middle ear we have reduced the size of the middle ear tympanic cavity we have placed the graft this stelcian tube uh the session tube will drain and ventilate this ventilate this small part of the middle ear 
which we have created. The other mass, uh, part of the middle layer cliff, master cavity, which used to be drained and ventilated by eustachian tube, is now exteriorized along the EAC. We have made a very big cavity. So from outside, this canal wall down procedure looks like this, a very big mastered cavity. This is the new tympanic membrane. So it looks unattractive, canal wall down procedure. The, but the advantage is that the recurrence and the residual rate of the disease is very low. Yes, now this is the canal wall down procedure. Modified radical mastoidectomy. This is the mastered cavity, antrum and the air cells. This is all exteriorized and made a common cavity with the EAC and the tympanic membrane here. Uh, sorry, tympanic cavity. This is the lateral semicircular canal bulge. This is the head of stapes. This pyramid stapedial tendon. This is facial nerve. This is middle cavity, round window. This is the vertical part of facial nerve. So we have made this whole common cavity which drains and gets ventilated through the wide external auditory meters. We place a graft over this and create a very small tympanic cavity. Okay, now I'll answer your questions. Okay, you can ask questions. Okay, Sandeep Brown here, canal up and down uh, procedures, okay. Canal wall up and canal wall down procedures is basically divided just, if we keep the canal wall, posterior canal wall, then it's called canal wall up. When we remove the canal wall, it's canal wall down. So in cortical mastoidectomy, we just remove the cortex of the mastoid antrum. We just remove the disease from the mastoid antrum and then we do nothing. We do not touch the posterior canal wall. So it's a canal wall up procedure. But if the disease is extensive and goes is in mesotympanum, epitympanum, everything, then we remove the disease through the posterior tympanotomy without removing the posterior canal wall. Then it's again the canal wall up procedure. And in canal wall up procedure, then we close the wound, the everything is same except that we have drilled some amount of bone in the mastered antrum and we have removed the disease, but we have not removed or drilled the posterior canal wall up. So the physiology remains the same, like normal. Just like the middle ear cliff gets ventilated, the mastered antrum, air cells, and all those tympanic cavity gets ventilated through the eustachian tube and they retain the respiratory epithelium. So they start functioning like uh, previously, but in canal wall down procedures, we have exteriorized the mastered antrum and some part of tympanic cavity to the outside by removing the canal wall, bony canal wall, making a big soup bowl. This is the difference between the canal wall up, canal wall down procedures, and in canal wall down procedures, the types of canal wall down procedures one is the radical mastoidectomy, the another is the modified radical mastoidectomy. And the difference between canal wall up and the down procedures, canal wall up procedure is very good. Aesthetically very good, but the disadvantage is that it requires second look surgery after six months because the chance of recurrence and the residual disease is more in canal wall up procedure. Though canal wall down procedure is looks ugly with a big hole in the ear, but it's safe. Mm. 
another person. Another person. Okay. Round window selling effect. Uh, you will get to know about next class physiology of hearing. I can later next class. Okay. So, round window selling effect. Complications, or you can call sequelae. The first sequelae once. Uh, uh, please kindly mute your mic. Complications, radical mastectomy. You have removed all the obstacles. You have plugged the eustachian tube. So one sequelae is that your you lose your hearing. And on radical mastectomy, just like any other mastectomy, there might be injury to the facial nerve, cord tympani, usually sacrificed, and there might be injury to the uh, foot plate, step is foot plate or lateral semicircular canal, again leading to the sensory neural hearing loss or recurrent vertigo these are the complications of radial mass radical mastectomy radical mastectomy these days are not done except for temporal bone neoplasm so from sandeep ronia why cholecystoma is not seen in tuber tympanic even with the central perforation by the epithelial invagination theory this is very good question uh, epithelial invagination invagination theory is a just a theory is a one of the theories and in tub tuber tympanic type, the uh, the other mechanism once the uh, perforation is there, the um, migration, the invagination doesn't occur, and the invagination theory is one of the strongest theory than this uh, epithelial migration theory. This epithelial migration theory. This is a weak theory. So mostly cholecystoma is not seen in tuber tympanic, even with the central perforation. The mechanism in the uh, tuber tympanic is there is central perforation, and there is recurrent infection uh, through this perforation from the outside. So it causes the mucosal disease, just ear discharge, but it might not develop to the cholecystoma. But not certainly, not on 100% cases. In some cases of tuber, tuber tympanic disease, long-standing disease, it might develop cholecystoma. So, sir, what is cholesteatoma here? Cholesteatoma, I have explained what is cholesteatoma. It's a just three-dimensional structure, epidermal structure, sac-like structure, which has characteristic of growing on itself. It erodes the bones, ossicles, uh, underlying bones, causing many complications. If it erodes the tegmen, it might breach the intracranial cavity and cause meningitis and many other compl intracranial complications. So cholecystoma is the very indispensable part of unsafe disease. Further questions?